we feel very empowered by a lot of this social media with what we can produce and share and do so quickly, reach so many people uh, through many forms of media and make such an impact. The downside is, I think, we still have the disconnect with not treating that environment like we do our organic environment and not being mindful that there are real people like us on the other end. ADHD Rewired, episode number 51. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part. So let's get started. But first, let me tell you about this. But I definitely have noticed that my ability to recall things from spoken word is way better than it is in reading. So much so that um, I will, when students write papers for me, if I've got to read a bunch of papers that are all the same, it, I just freeze because it's... it's is she going to read be able to. I do. I, I spent... I think I spent a hundred dollars on a reading app that had the most human like narration. Really? And there, it helps. That's interesting. And I can also adjust the speed with that too. You should require your students to submit their um, papers with an audio recording. Oh God, no. They would hate you. <laughs> I don't know how they would do that. Evernote? Yeah, I can't do Evernote. I'm overwhelmed by that. Really? Oh, it's ever ever know it, it's once you oh, understand like that. What's that? I know you like that. I've heard you talk about that before. And a I used to not like do. it. So it's like I, I get where you're coming from. But I, I think I didn't understand it. Like what how you actually use it. Well, there is a book that I that I saw on the Kindle Unlimited that maybe if I ever clear some time. You know, but I listen how do I listen to these books when well, I'm still on that question? I listen to them every night. I fall asleep to them. Sometimes they work into my dreams. <laughs> and yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, I'm sure they should choose your books wisely then. I do. Um, and then I usually, um, in the morning, I have to take some medicine before I can really move my body. So I usually will get up and take some medication, and then it takes me about an hour before I feel like I can get up and get moving. Mm -hmm. That's pure listening time for me. You, you're hardcore. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Hello, hello, ADHD Rewired listeners. Before we dive into the interview today, let's check the ADHD Rewired voicemail line. Do you have a message that you want to leave for ADHD Rewired that you want shared with the community? You can go to speakpipe.com slash ADHD Rewired and leave me a message there. There is also a direct link to SpeakPipe on my website. Just go to erictivers.com slash podcast and you'll see the link for SpeakPipe there. It says leave a message. So we're going to hear from Jeff, who was a member of our community call from last week's 50th episode. Wasn't that a fun episode? I I'm still kind of buzzing from that and it's been a week. So here's that voicemail. Buenos dias, Eric. This is Jeff from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hey, thanks again for letting me be a part of the event the other day. That was uh, that was great. Lots of fun. So, um, a funny ADHD story. You know, I've got one. My my wife, uh, she's talked about this for years. About sixteen years ago, she was uh, pregnant with our son, who ironically has ADHD and goes into labor while we're at the house. So this is our second child. I figured I had everything under control, knew how to get her out the door, had to, had all the processes in place. So off we go. Except I forgot to take her before picture so we could make the comparisons. So we did that, and then I get her out to the car, and I had actually forgotten to put the bag that I had packed weeks ago for her in the car. I meant to do it. I just forgot to do it. So I went back, got the bag. She's loaded her up in the car. She's sitting there, <laughs> put it in the trunk. 
oh, I forgot to call my sister and tell her to pick up my daughter from the daycare since we weren't going to be able to do it. So I call my sister. We get that taken care of. Go to leave again. My wallet. Oh, I forgot my wallet. So we'll go back in to get my wallet. Oh, there's probably half a dozen things that came up like that, as you can probably imagine. So by the time we got to the hospital, because my poor wife had been sitting out in the driveway for over 30 minutes waiting for me to get her out the door with contractions, timing them herself. So by the time we got to the hospital, she was over nine centimeters dilated. And wow, baby boy came very soon after that. <laughs> so at the time, of course, we didn't have any idea. And even she's been telling that story for years and years and years. I didn't even associate it with ADHD. But now looking back on it, I say it's pretty typical. Well, hey, thanks for letting me share my story. Um, really getting so much value out of all the uh, resources that you provide in the podcast and things on your website and the tools. Um, and I've been improving and making my son's life a little easier as well. Uh, so thanks again, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Jeff, thank you so much for the voicemail. Uh, sometimes I forget to check my voicemail, but it was nice that I checked it around the time that you sent that. So I didn't have a, an unanswered voicemail uh, going for too long because I have had that before. Um, you mentioned the resources on my website, and I want to mention that I have a new resource that I am so, so excited uh, to share with you, the ADHD Rewired community, the listeners of this podcast. So I don't know if you had a chance to check out uh, the website, my, my website, ADHDrewired.com. Um, which was actually down for a, a few moments this past week, um, moving some things around on uh, my, my domain hosting. So hopefully that's all resolved. Um, but speaking of tangents, um, one of the things that you will see on the show notes for this uh, for last week's episode, the 50th episode, is the video, the un edited video of the call that you heard from last week where we had 15 or so people in this zoom conference call in, in this zoom room. It's kind of like uh, Google Hangouts, except that it works and it's really easy to use and has lots of really cool features. Uh, you know, one of the, the great features on it is really easily you can record both an MP3 file uh, and the video file of what's happening during that screencast. You can actually get a free uh, free membership of this, and that will allow you to have up to 25 people in a group, um, and your call could be up to 40 minutes. Now, if you want a call that's more than 40 minutes, here's here's the part that I'm excited about. I reached out to SpeakPipe, or not SpeakPipe. Um, I reached, that's what I'm looking at my screen right now. We just listened to that voicemail. I reached out to Zoom, um, and I, and I, told them in an email that I kind of have a, a, a crush on them as a company. I'm, I'm absolutely in love with this company, with this product. It is, it's really everything that I need as a coach um, doing the types of things that I'm doing here at the podcast. I have now switched from recording my interviews on Skype uh, over to doing it on Zoom. It's just super easy. The mobile uh, platform is really easy to use. The desktop platform is really easy to use. It just works. When I was trying to figure out what's going to be the best platform for uh, the, the coaching group that I'm doing right now. I, I What I actually did is I sent links out to the people that I knew uh, online who maybe were a little bit tech technologically challenged, and everyone that I sent the to uh, was able to connect easily. And one of the things that I do that's really cool is I can actually join basically three different times. So I can have my desktop version and my iPad and my iPhone. So if I'm doing a screen share, which is really easy to do, I can see what other people are seeing in the room. I mean, it's really, really awesome. You can get a, a look at what it's actually like um, just by going to erictibbers.com slash 50. Um, the, the show notes and the Zoom video uh, are on there. I am also doing some more stuff on YouTube where I'm posting some of the unedited video um, interviews on there as well. And they are also posted when I do a video um, in the Facebook group. So 
I've teamed up. Um, I kind of begged Zoom to, to partner up with me. Um, no shame in, in saying that because I just think they're fantastic. And I think that there's so much uh, value to this, whether it's you need help with something, you can do a really easy screen share. Um, you can do a virtual whiteboard. I'm, I'm just seriously, when I say that I kind of have a crush on this service, I'm, I'm serious. So think it's weird. I don't care. I love it. And I think that you will too. Um, so I'm right now working on setting up a uh, kind of a, a, a redirect to my website. But if you go to uh, erictivers.com slash zoom, that's going to bring you uh, to a page on my website where you can then connect to zoom. So um, that's just a way to tell uh, tell Zoom that I was the one that sent you. I really think you will love it. Um, you know, there's you can get a pretty high value out of it and not pay a dime. The free membership is great. Um, want a couple extra whistles just by being able to do a longer than 40 minute meeting? Go for it. Um, go to my website, erictivers.com slash Zoom, and you'll get a link right there. Oh, and by the way, they uh, part of their their service also includes a HIPAA compliant um, uh, protocol. So if that is so, if that the high level of, of privacy, if you're a therapist, you're a coach, and you would like something that is HIPAA compliant, Zoom does that. Go check it out, EricTivers.com/slash/Zoom. And thanks. Now let's get on with the episode. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am here with my guest in the virtual ADHD Rewired studios. His name is Grant Crowell. He is a social media, he refers to himself as a social media stylist. Um, if you're wondering what the heck is that, as I first did when I first heard that, um, he basically really brings out the social in social media, and that's one of his big focuses. Professionally, he's a YouTube network manager. He uh, is originally from Hawaii, and he is now living in the Chicago area. I don't know why. Um, his past jobs include things doing social media, video marketing analysis. Um, he does search engine optimization. He was a talk show host for an AM radio station, a cartoonist, a comedy, worked at a comedy club, public relations. He uh, did editorial work for the Army Reserves. Uh, he was a documentary film producer. And including in uh, this year's past Chad conference, he uh, did some nice documentary work by interviewing some of the uh, speakers that were at this past year's Chad conference. And we'll certainly put a link to, the, uh, to those videos in the show notes, um, some of his bigger accomplishments. Um, he ran, he did something good in track. I'm trying to now fast forward through your, uh, through this. Um, his hobbies include uh, podcasting, running, writing, public speaking, craft beer. He's a foodie, video production, and doodling. His career goal is to teach social skills to the digitally disadvantaged. And let's just take it from there. Grant, glad to have you on the show. How are you? Sir Eric, it is so good to be on your show. I felt with that that long that long preview like I was auditioning for Miss America or something, but it sounded good to me. Okay, Mr. Trump, good way to go. Hey, so good to be with the master of monkeys himself, Eric. And that's because I enjoy your monkey puppet. Um, and and being in the rewired, how do you put it, the virtual studios? What what a classy joint you got here. <laughs> Virtual studios. I, and huh? I didn't even have to clean up. Isn't it nice? <laughs> yeah, we can we can be slobs here in our virtual studios because snap your fingers, it magically goes away. Hey, joy to the matrix. Well, Grant, it's it's uh, you know we've we've known each other for for a while. Um, you uh, so you participated in the first ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group, and we got to kind of know each other both through that and just through kind of uh, sharing ideas about social media. Um, content marketing, and we got a, uh, a great opportunity to meet each other at the Chad conference. And you've even come to a, a Chad uh, um, local, the Chad meeting that I run. So um, we you know we've we've had our, our our a few of a few run-ins with each other uh, since we've known each other. Yeah, we have, and, and there's there's a nice story behind all this. I mean, how did we meet up, or how did I even hear of you? And the funny thing is, I had been searching for somebody 
with an understanding, appreciation, and engagement in social media in the ADHD community. I mean, at first, I think it was back in 2011 when I remember on Chicago PBS, the the special ADD and loving it yes. uh, with Rick and Ava Green. And that to me was the turning point. I was diagnosed in 2003, uh, but uh, it was not, it was at a bad time in my life. And the medication that I had tried at the time didn't work. And because I was now in a really good, solid relationship with my spouse, uh, I thought, um, Finally, someone who gets it, who can be, who can realize this kind of stuff can be entertaining, can be personal, and uh, so I joined their their group, their community site, thetotalady.com, and I would be asking them, saying, "Hey, if you ever know of anyone who is doing stuff on this, because I work in social media, I've actually worked in social media for large companies as well as small ones, and I am a, a YouTube specialist as well, and I was just trying to just be on the lookout for a long time, and then finally, uh, through a shared acquaintance as well as them, said that, oh, we're going to be at this conference, uh, I think it was just from last year, if I'm not mistaken, and I couldn't go there. But lo and behold, you're you're not too far away from from where I live, and and what a surprise! And then your podcast stuff comes out, and I'm saying, yeah, this this guy gets it. Cool. I mean, that's that's. Um, I was wondering. I'm like, how did we we meet? So I'm glad that you remembered. Uh, <laughs> I, I was going to say, well, when you contacted me on Grinder, but uh, I'm not that kind of girl. That's no, all right, people. We're we're just made that stuff up. But that that is the story. That that is the real story. And this this is the testimony to social media on putting content out, listening, enjoying conversations with other people, and paying attention. Because so many people don't do that. They just put something out there saying, "Look at me," and and love me or buy my stuff. And you truly care about uh, the people who are on the other end and just being being helpful. So that really is a story of how we're here today and how I signed up for your. So let's back up even a, a little further from that. Um, take us to the point where you uh, sought out that, that diagnosis. Okay. Uh, the first time I had a diagnosis, 2003. Now, this is something that I thought I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look back in my memorabilia. And, and I remember looking at something from before I was five years old, and it was from a psychiatrist, uh, two different psychiatrists, who are talking about, well, we think this, this kid has a learning disability, but he's also really creative and really smart in other areas, but seems to have issues with communication. Uh, it, it seemed to me, reading that, that it was like they were trying to say this is ADHD, but couldn't necessarily use that term. Uh, there, and we're talking about, I'm 44 years old, so this was 1975 at the time it happened. So for all this time, be, you know, getting up to the point of diagnosis, I'm unconsciously doing things that help with my ADHD. Uh, being a competitive distance runner, I was second in the state in track and did a few marathons as well, uh, doing, trying to gravitate towards creative things like being a professional cartoonist, working in talk radio. Th these are graphic design, good fields uh, that can help you, but I didn't understand my condition when I had. So it, it really hurt me in jobs, in relationships. How so? Like, tell, tell us about that. Okay. Well, one thing is over-promising and under-delivering. Another thing is just not, not I, my working memory without medication training is absolutely horrible. I tell people, all right, imagine if somebody has a good experience being on pot. That's how my brain can be all the time. Nothing is in focus. Uh, it, it, I mean, you, yeah, so when we talk about when we get about how some people like to say, is, oh, I'm really creative. I have special powers. Well, there's sometimes you just want to need to be able to get stuff done, and I couldn't. I could not stay engaged. So, um, and sometimes my classes would be very, very boring. So doodling would be my way of trying to stay involved, but of course, this is at a time where you're considered to be a slacker or lazy or not paying attention. So there, there were those type of things. It would also be that I could be hyper reactive to something. Uh, I mean, on one end, I could be very empathetic, but on the other end is I would lack context of, you know, what is an appropriate way to behave in certain situations. Uh, that can probably work very well for people who are artistic and, uh, and maybe in a creative environment. Not so well when you have to know when you're at a job like I was after coming out of college where I had to work for a credit rating firm. Uh, and that's you wear your tie. You are mm -hmm. uh, supposed to be structured. It, it is a kiss of death for somebody in, in ADHD, a job that was so boring. And this was pre-Internet days, people. So everything was controlled. Um, you know, on some on some levels, there are certain things where the structure is good, uh, like my being in the army to pay for college, but there's no way I could ever do something like it as a career. I'd be blowing my brains out. Uh, but when I got diagnosed, it was after a long period of, okay, I'm leaving my keys in the car again, again. I'm doing these same things again, and 
I would try to find ways of, well, maybe if I just start talking to myself, then I'll remind myself. And I look a bit like a schizophrenic doing these kind of things, too. <laughs> so there, there are these things you're trying to overcompensate for, but then end up being socially awkward. So what do you do? So at that time, uh, I remember, and I was in, you know, at the time I married and married early, and I married someone who had her own issues. She had bipolar disorder, clinical depression. And I think at that How point, old were you when you got married? I was 24. Uh, okay. She was nearly seven years my senior, and I thought this is a good way for me maybe to grow up. But I really hadn't had much relationship experience. Uh, I, I do consider that as I was developmentally disabled or I was you know, behind in, in that place. I mean, I okay. could communicate really well. I could do a talk show really well. But relationships is I, I struggled very much in being in a healthy one. So I think I, I end up selling or we both end up selling for something that was not ideal or even good for both of us. But and trying to move forward in our lives. So at that point, it was so much bad stuff was happening to me. I wasn't sleeping well at all. I was at a um, job I hated. And uh, also at the same time, trying to run my own freelance company too. Uh, and uh, at that time when I decided I'm just going to you know, work full time for myself, but I'm forgetting so many things. I'm not, uh, I'm spending too much time procrastinating or things taking way longer than they should. So I just dealt with the ADHD when I was told that I had ADHD or exhibit all the signs to a T, that uh, this was something that would help me remember. Problem well, at that was, time was- What was your kind of your fed up point the, the, where you're just like, this is something is not right. So you're, you're talking to yourself, trying to do all these different strategies. It's not working for you. What was that kind of breaking point where you're like, you know what? I, I got to figure this out. I got to make that appointment. I got to find out what's going on. What, tell us that, the details of that. I, th I think you know, as much as I remember locking my car, uh, my keys in my car and doing that so often, and and it was, I think it was at a point where, great, now I'm not getting paid for a day's work, and this just adding struggle after struggle. So I don't know if it was like the absolute one big thing, uh, but how I look at it as is that uh, things like I, I think I remember now leaving an oven on, and it being. Uh, an argument and yelling over these things. Uh, it, but I think something like that, where it could put myself in harm's way, or I'd put myself in harm's way, or, um, was I realizing I'm not an easy person to live with. Now at this time, we have to add one other thing. I had major, major sleep apnea. So I, and how bad was it? I couldn't even wear a CPAP machine because I had allergies really bad. I, oh, I, now I think I remember what it was. I crashed my car during the day because I was so damn tired for the second time. And now I, it was only 50 feet away from the house, but I was just so used to, okay, I got to make it home, get to make it home. And I punched myself so many times in my leg or slapped myself to try oh to stay gosh. awake. And then, but when I was so close, I thought, finally I can relax. Well, I blacked out and then <sighs> I, I, I slowly... Uh, well, I say I suddenly wake up when my car has hit a tree <laughs> and it was the wow. second time so close to the house. So I thought this is just crazy. Something is just really, really not right about me or a lot of things are really not right about me. And I don't understand why I'm failing at so many things. Uh, so that was the time where I went to a psychiatrist. I got medication at the time. It was Ritalin and Adderall. Neither of those things. I mean, I was alert. But I felt like I was losing my personality. I think the unfortunate thing about it is why did I go off that after like six months was I didn't feel like I had a very understanding spouse. Um, when I said when I was communicating with her mm -hmm. that I don't feel like me anymore. Her response is this is how normal people feel. Not not sympathetic, almost just angry. And I also remember her other response was when she found out I had the ADHD was it's not fair. You're supposed to be taking care of me. So I had resentment. Uh, I had a lot of resentment. And, and then talking with that same psychiatrist would say that, well, you know, for some people, the goal is to not be on medication. So I thought maybe I just need to be doing other things and try to focus on other things. But the problem was, is I did not have a support system in place. So I think I was off of it out of defiance. And it was only when I was in a very good relationship with somebody that I just I love, but so good for me in so many ways. Then she was bringing up all these things that she noticed and said that the, the big issue I have is working memory. I don't put things in sequence or I just have whiteouts. Whiteouts as in I could be walking a little bit up the stairs. Where am I? What am I doing? Why did I do something like that? Uh, happening all the time. And that's what I tell people. When you're an ADHD person or a person with severe ADHD, this isn't just a once occurrence. It's frequent. Right. It's dangerous. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's you know it's 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 almost like our brain can have bad cell phone reception like all the time, where it's uh, we we drop we drop data we drop pieces of information uh, and often important pieces of information. Um, you know, so just as a quick kind of a, um, a note for people who are like working memory, what what's that? Um, you know, it's a, basically it's our brain's mental scratch pad. It's the our ability. You know, a lot of people actually confuse short term memory with working memory. You know, that working memory is our ability to hold on to a piece of information while actually doing something else, either with that or without that information. So it could be you're working on something and you get interrupted. Are you able to hold on to that piece of information while attending to the interruption and then be able to effectively go back to what you're working on? People without ADHD who don't who do not have an impaired working memory can do this. It's like a magic trick when I watch it happen. For me, my magic trick is when I get an interruption, I either try to prevent it before it happens altogether or I have to write something down as a bookmark because it's it's gonna get I assume I'm going to forget. That's my default position. For so, me all the time. And here, here is a good example of how I was able to use working memory with the help of running. And this is in high school. And I mean, Hawaii is a wonderful And you're a big runner. To, that's that's to, something to you're, you're really into. Yeah. Well, now I'm a big runner and then I'm 220 pounds. So, but back then, <laughs> Grant, I, would, I, was in, I was in competitive shape. <laughs> ba -ba -boom. Yeah. Uh, boy, do I make shockwaves when I when I hit the ground. But what I would do sometimes, I'd get all these creative ideas in my head. And my strategy then, and th we're talking about this is 1988 or 1987. So what do you do when you don't have your phone? There's nothing to talk to. I would repeat. I would if I had an idea in my head, I would try to remember one word out of that idea, and then remember the first letter of that word. So if I got ten ideas, I could just try to remember those letters of the first order of that idea and oh all come to play. And voila, then I would get my cartoons and that would be how I got to be also doing regular cartoons professionally. So that was my, my system. Creepy, huh? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Just like thinking about like how much brain resource you were really using in trying to keep all this information in your head in this complex. Wow. I, I had to work so hard and I tell people, you know, even though I work so much in digital and social media, it's some, it's the acts of writing something on a whiteboard uh, that, that m allows me to remember having post-its around, doing certain th things that I can wean myself off of sometimes because I'm training myself. But back then for so long, at a place I worked at, I didn't even get a whiteboard. Uh, I, there was no way I could retain stuff, so I'd be trying to doodle or do some things that would keep me in the moment. But that's how hard it was. I mean, I would have zero working memory. Uh, I would, I mean, it, it wouldn't be a far stretch to say, why did you put this orange juice in the cupboard? Uh, you just don't realize what's happened, and then you wonder how that happened. I tell people, you know, sometimes my life is like the movie Memento, a story about a guy who only has short-term memory and has to go by instinct sometimes. But uh, as as weird as that sounds that really was my life you know grant i, I don't think that's uh, going to sound actually too weird to most of the people listening to this i think that's going to describe a lot of people's uh challenges maybe even to a t well then we have a, we have a good movie library then <laughs> <laughs> so now you have found um, a lot of things that do work for you. You know, I I think Grant, that you and I could probably both agree that uh, for an as an adult, um, they they probably the two most important things outside of medication may be a good job and an understanding supportive spouse. Wholeheartedly, yes. I mean, we we talk we you talk about a lot of other things in your show which are so important, like sleep. Like if I pull an all nighter, which I recently does, how how badly that affects you. And there's some things that, I mean, that that happens with a certain job, um, like once every certain amount of months. But I can't. I know those are things I can't be around. Having a good job is so much about in tune with your energy level. Uh, we talk a lot about time management, but energy management you right. talk about is so important. You have to assess uh, w how how are you feeling. I mean, sometimes it's just I, I have the energy, but what's also your emotional state? Uh, if you're feeling emotionally, you know, an anxiety, that's probably not a good time to be answering sensitive emails or, right. or typing sensitive stuff, or it's not a good time to be posting. I'd like to see stuff like that that is kind of where you have a breathalyzer, the equivalent of like a social meter <laughs> that, that you set for yourself and have an app before you're posting posting before you're reading certain things that that know that knows yourself well I mean uh, but having a, a supportive spouse me going from somebody who I can say you know Austin was a very abusive relationship to somebody who gave me the tough love 
uh, who wasn't trying to dig me out of a ditch that great because I hadn't even done my taxes for five years. Uh, and I can only imagine trouble the IRS, but she got me around to doing it. I mean, that's one of the worst things for somebody running a business is uh, who has ADHD, severe ADHD, is the things you just can't get around to doing. Uh, you don't even understand why. But she helped me do that. She got me on track. Tell, and now tell, can you tell us a little bit about that? So you were, you didn't pay your taxes for five years, and I and I am sure that there are a good handful of people listening to this that are going to be thinking, I'm not the only one. Oh, my gosh, how did he get through it? <laughs> well, imagine this is I how I did that is I made the bad decision of having my then wife and I were married for nine years to go into business together. She had her own issues socially uh, with, with her clinical depression. She quit or got fired from several jobs for it. Um, you know, Mensa IQ, but just had a lot of trouble getting along. We met in Hawaii, by the way, which is very much about getting along with other people. The word is Ohana or family for that. Uh, she's from Illinois, ironically, Woodstock, Illinois. And us, we thought we'd be together and uh, and work in the same business together. Problem was, is that uh, she wanted to be at the forefront while I was doing, my, basically do the speaking engagements while I had to basically be doing all the grunt work, the crappy work, and as well as my full-time job in Chicago. So I ended up hating what I was doing. And so mm -hmm. I, w I would have a hard time following through on certain things that were unpleasant. I mean, I did build the contracts. I did do the invoicing, but I didn't want to be dealing with stuff like finances and taxes. We didn't even give each other salaries. And that got into a lot of arguments around money. So I just didn't want to deal with something that I thought I was going to get into more arguments with. And uh, even though I do remember a time I was even begging for help and not getting that, and I kind of felt like it was a bit of self-sabotage. But I went from that to not even filing things like uh, corporate taxes to also getting some bad advice from, uh, from an attorney on how I should set up my business. I mean, ultimately, I take responsibility for these things, but there's so many things that can go wrong, and it takes such dedication to run a business mm -hmm. uh, back then. And then it was just at a time where, uh, uh, while after getting divorced, the economy busted, I had clients that weren't paying me. <laughs> And, uh, and when you're small, that is so hard to deal with. So it's just a culmination of so many things. So, and then getting creditors to call you again, distraction on top of distraction on top of distraction. And then you're trying to figure out how do I be making some money doing this? So you don't, there's no guarantee of what you're doing is going to work. So how did so, you get out of it? Well, what I did is I found, uh, I found my spouse or she found me. We were just on, on, on an online dating site and how well at first it wasn't supposed to be anything serious but we got along so well uh, how it worked how it happened is she was having major back issues and needed somebody to help around this house she had here and uh, we just so first it was just be something for each of our best interests while I was probably gonna be moving to Seattle stay with a friend and get my life back on track because I got out of a previous short-term relationship that I thought I gotta work on myself um, I can't be avoiding this issue so when when she and I her name's Karen we went out to dinner I explained to her I have these really bad financial issues and it was a shock to her and she had to decide if this is something that she want to deal with uh, she did but it was she has such a strong financial background she made me watch Suze Yorman uh, so many shows about budgeting and her own background was being poor real poor and having a mother who gambled her her own savings away mm -hmm. when she was just in college so she went through all those things really badly they didn't stick stick with me even though I had other issues with a lot of my money always being stolen and nothing being done about it, so I had no stability but with with Karen I can now start to see and visualize okay if I do this I get to my six month savings if I do this I'm able to start again my IRA because the truth is Eric is I did have an inheritance from when my parents passed away but without without having the guidance or having a system or basically being able to be rewired mm -hmm. I blew all that money and you know I think to the the notion of you know it's like you, you put something off and now you know you're behind on something and then it like exponentially becomes this bigger task and it becomes more and more overwhelming so I just, you know, just to know that you can be in a position where you can be so behind on something as of not paying your taxes for five years and you can come out from that. I think that's really good to hear. Yeah, and I can say this. Once I started doing the taxes, I realized I actually didn't owe money. 
<laughs> I didn't owe money. So all this time I was stressing out. Now, I wasn't paying certain things, such as you're supposed to uh, pay things, such as, uh, un- well, you know, basically income tax, things that are, that are right. part of being a small business, what you have to pay no matter what. But that was small. But I think I probably have a testimony being the only person in the state of Illinois that was able to use ADHD as an argument for getting all punitive fees waived. Now, I couldn't do it at the IRS, but I got my psychiatrist to send a letter saying these are clearly Grant's issues that, uh, that he said I contribute to why he wasn't doing these things. I couldn't do it with the IRS because the IRS did uh, would send me information on if you're having issues, this is what you can do. So, But Illinois Department of Revenue, I, I, I got a reprieve. Uh, I, wow. I don't know if there's anybody else that has been able to do a reprieve. I've never heard of, like, I, I, I always assumed that, like, I always wished that, like, creditors can just be, you know, understanding of my, you know, the lateness. But I never assumed that that would actually, you know, you can use ADHD as an explanation and, and get some. Uh, I mean, that's that's great. I, I it's, I'm sort of speechless about that. That's, uh... <laughs> yeah, in this case, it was an excuse and an explanation. Uh, but uh, I, I will say this: when I when I went to bankruptcy court, mm-hmm. and uh, when I'm I'm waiting in line, I'm hearing stories of other people, and they have things like they people are hoping to keep. Like some person want to say, "I want to keep. My, can I keep my yacht or my <laughs> my car that was clearly too expensive or m- much more of a luxury than transportation?" And when I go there and show what I have, the guy uh, the guy who's on the other end is saying, "Why didn't you come to us way earlier, man?" Uh, it, it, so it was like, "What are you waiting for?" But here here's how bad it was. Even for a period of time, when I was on my on my own, I thought, "Okay, I even need to be on food stamps." But I had sold so much of my stuff that I couldn't even convince uh, the guy working for you know the state that I was really struggling because he because he thought well how could you have been on your own for so much without making income for so long, and uh, so he denied me and then I reapplied and then I got all this mo- back money for food stamps too so I just felt like maybe I this was something that was. I, I did something really bad, and there was a sense of shame for a while. I think it was once getting past that sense of shame and then realizing there's so many more people like this and finding other people who go through the same kind of struggles. You realize you're not alone and you're not a bad person, but you still you still got to fix things. So, and, and not going through all the details of from there to now, how are you managing your finances? Well, I can say I'm very proud to say going from then, I have a 731 credit score, which is in the excellent range. That's really good. I have um, a good amount of money now in my IRA, a Roth IRA. What about tools? Uh, I use Quicken and I use Mint. Uh, the Quicken, I do things in envelopes. So I'm not going by what I would do in the past and see, oh, there's money in my savings. Oh, there's money. I mean, when I was even way, way worse, I'd be using credit cards, especially for my documentary film thing that was just going to really take me someplace and didn't. Uh, I, I look at things from what have I already budgeted, and at the end of the month, I look through with my spouse over how much did I spend, and then realistically, do I need to adjust things month to month? Uh, I like doing it that way. I like it making it not so easy for me to take money out and make myself more more mindful. So it's been such a transition where I don't have any stress, but also I spend a lot less. So it is part about when you're busy and you have a job that keeps you busy. Otherwise, you get bored and you want to do things that, that validate. And sometimes shopping is one of those things. So it is so important to have a job that keeps you occupied and a budget that you can look at and be mindful of. It's been It's been such a transition. Speaking of transitions, we're going to take a quick break uh, to thank our sponsor, and then we'll be right back to talk about all things social. This podcast is brought to you by Audible. Hey, have you checked out on my website, erictivers.com slash audible? Carolyn made a great presentation, a uh, slide share show that has, uh, I think, 21 of her favorite uh, audiobooks. And uh, a lot of people have been um, letting me know and letting her know that they've really enjoyed uh, what she put together. So go check that out if you're looking for some suggestions. I also just added a comment section right below that. So after you get your free audiobook, leave a comment to let us know if it was any good or not. So we know if we should check that one out as well. Go to erictivers.com slash audible for the recommendations that you can get for your free audiobook download. Or if you know what you want, skip the line, go right to the spot. And that's at audibletrial.com slash ADHD 
Rewired. Do you need an easy way to connect with people virtually, but don't want to be hassled by downloads that don't work, connections that are complicated? Go to erictivers.com slash Zoom and check out truly what I think is a revolutionarily easy to use video conferencing platform. That's erictivers.com slash Zoom. <laughs> We are back. Grant, hopefully you're still with me. No, I went out to, to grab something. What happened? <laughs> that, was a great, that was a great interlude, by the way. I love that. That, that was, one, I think, your best one yet. <laughs> yeah, best you know, I was, I was looking for it. Yeah, I, I tried to think, yeah, how, where's that transition word? How can I bridge it? And when he said that, I was like, oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> nice to know I can help you out with your AHD while the show is going in progress. Th th thanks, thanks for lobbing the softball. I appreciate it. <laughs> Okay. Home run. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about social. You know, we talk about social media and people kind of forget this. You know, they just view it as media, not realizing that, you know, the people on the other end are people and we respond to each other based on, you know, we, we have thoughts and we have feelings and it's not just zeros and ones that we're posting this uh, stuff to. So kind of let's talk a little bit about that. And I also want to talk a little bit about the, the whole notion of virtual ADD. I know you wrote an article uh, about that, and I had, uh, I, I had some opinions about that that we can discuss. Um, so where do you want to begin on the, the social journey? Okay, on the social journey is let's talk about social because one, one area that gets used so much it's almost like a buzzword for things that are just supposed to be naturally social, social networking. Well, what other kind of networking is there supposed to be? Uh, it, it, in, and sometimes it, uh, when it gets to be over-commercialized, people get turned off by the word. Uh, I have been by nature, and I can attribute part of this to my ADHD, as being extremely social. And by that, I mean as someone, this is how I define social, uh, someone who makes a personal investment to do genuine relationships for shared value. Uh, I was actually one of the first people when I did work for a publication called Real SEO uh, back in 2007 and uh, early in 2006 to talk about social video, not just broadcast, but willing to have an exchange, a genuine exchange with other people. And what, what really defines social today is consumers have so much more power. Consumers are not just media, are not just consumers. They're producers. They they on some it's are influencers. They're sometimes celebrities. I mean, YouTube is is one of the best examples of that, and that shows where uh, a big company can have some very stiff competition from a Joe Schmo who knows how to engage with their audience and put out something creative and just be there to listen, pay attention, and have fun. Of course, uh, these are the type of things that what I love about how you know this is the best time where creativity and technology have have converged uh, it's and this is is going further and further but to me what i've seen in socials me i've worked in social when i mentioned talk radio as a cartoonist i did for a while a type of interactive print newspaper putting it outside a, a student newspaper place that i worked at and said let's just get people to write or share their own cartoons their own articles their own stories on a big bulletin board here this doesn't just have to be about some people who decide what everybody else gets to see so i was thinking of social before the way we consider today because without without people social doesn't have anything it, it requires people the problem that i see today is along with we feel very empowered by a lot of this social media with what we can produce and share and do so quickly, reach so many people uh, through many forms of media and make such an impact. The downside is, I think, we still have the disconnect with not treating that environment like we do our organic environment and not being mindful that there are real people like us on the other end. I think the problem comes is we're expected to be so impulsive. Sometimes for me, it's part of your job in terms of producing quickly. Uh, why that, that is where these platforms reward you for how quick you can do something. Mm -hmm. uh, the downside is you're not being a little more thoughtful. You're not pausing and thinking about what somebody has said. And I get this problem with uh, myself when I don't pay attention to what was really sent in the email or I wasn't paying attention to how I was feeling uh, and then read something the wrong way. Uh, the, the real problem comes from we have a disconnect with thinking that, well, if it happens online, we can treat people differently like we would in person. Uh, that, to me, I think is where the whole problem stems from. But the other problem is that we don't get all the cues 
that you would like if you right. or I were face to face. Um, yeah. And so much of what we talk about social skills, soft skills, emotional intelligence is really based on gaining cues. So what happens when you don't get these cues? Well, that's why I've, you know, pretty much just gone on a mission for I think the past six months to try to first address this problem across different platforms like LinkedIn, like Facebook, like YouTube, sometimes even having fun with dating sites like OkCupid about all the just, you know, what are really avoidable mistakes we can make, but also that None of this is common sense. We could use help, and I think the help comes from us sharing our experiences, where on one side, tech does help, but you have to work on yourself as a person, be accountable, and I think having discussions about this is a good way at least just simply starting a good conversation for the masses. So that's why I call myself the social stylist. My big goal is to help other people with improving their communication skills online. So let me ask you this, Grant. So... You know, part of what I'm doing here with with the podcast, with my my coaching and therapy practice, you know, is that it's like how how can I help someone with ADHD with time management and organizational issues when I have ADHD and time management and organizational issues? It's you know for so for me it's because I've I've learned so much from the struggle, from the challenges that I've had, and I've learned to kind of de you know uh, kind of crack that code of how does this stuff all work. Does your interest in this stem from a place of struggling with this at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think for anyone, uh, it's no different from somebody who is uh, an Al-Anon counselor. I mean, if somebody doesn't have these things, uh, you're always going to have the argument of you can't relate. So if you're getting somebody who doesn't, who says they don't have these issues, I especially say for this kind of field, you can't trust that at all because you have to experience it to really understand how to help other people. My issues are huge on, on here, huge. I mean, part of it could be, it's like, well, imagine if you're, you're looking for work and you get so many connection requests on LinkedIn for people who don't even pay attention to your profile, or then if you accept them, they don't actually want to talk with you. They just want to spam you. I mean, that's a huge, huge social faux pas. Or people, and I even had this with an ex-girlfriend. She'd want to start a conversation with me on IM, and then all of a sudden just not continue the conversation, and she'd get back to me 15 minutes later saying, oh, I was talking with some students uh, and because she was a teacher. And I was saying, telling you, you know, could you let me know what's going on? She got annoyed thinking that, well, it's a different standard online. And that's where these things really bother me on a personal level. Hmm. Uh, so it's, it's interesting, Grant, because I don't know if, you know, I, I definitely think that when it comes to, you know, instant messaging for my social uh, social component of it, I kind of assume that it's a, a casual conversation that you pick up where you can and, um, you know, you reply when you can. So, I, yeah, I don't know. I think that'd be really interesting. I'd love to hear what people, um, after listening to this episode, what kind of they, what do they do with, with the instant messaging? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting idea because uh, as you're describing that, I'm like, well, I kind of do that. I'll, I'll walk away from a, a messaging conversation because I get, you know, busy with something or, or preoccupied with something else. Um, yeah. so. And, and the, I think these things happen in certain, the whole issue, the word I love to use is context. Yes. Oh, that's, the it, context is everything. Context is everything in this space because the other person can't see where you're at, what you're doing necessarily. And so that's why you have to, in a sense, create these cues. You have to be mindful of that and saying, oh, I've got something going on. I'll get back to you. Really simple stuff. But here's, an, here's another good example. People who put up Facebook pages or businesses who put Facebook pages and they just broadcast, but they don't answer questions. Mm -hmm. They don't do. Um, they don't treat it as a form of engagement. They they don't do it as a customer service. It is just a billboard to them. And to me, and I think a lot of other people, being on social, it's a promise. It's a promise. You're not going to just simply say, "Look how great I think I am," or treat it as a cocktail party where you consider yourself the center of the show and you don't talk to everybody, anybody, but you expect everybody to talk to you. Uh, that's not that's not social. That's very anti-social. Uh, what I had the expectations of, if if you want me to have my like, if you want my attention, then you need to pay attention. If somebody wants me to give them a positive review on LinkedIn, but they've never had a conversation with me before, uh, what's wrong with this picture here? Eric, I'm talking to you. 
<laughs> just kidding. I'm not accusing you. We all do it. That's that's the thing. We all have these issues, and that's why I think now is a great time to be bringing up these issues and stories. And when I've talked with people in in who are ADHD experts, they've said, yeah, this not only needs to be talked about, but ADHD people can especially relate because I think sometimes not only are we empathetic to this, we get emotional. Yes. Uh, so, and that can hurt us. Like it's hurt me in in business. It's hurt me at jobs when I didn't understand, when I wasn't aware well, of how I was feeling. Will you kind of uh, take us through some of those things and some of the the um, you know, those, those lessons that you kind of took from those, ooh, I shouldn't do that again. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, so we call them the, the social faux pas. Yes. All right. All right. A big thing that we can relate to is the idea of multitasking. I think some ADHD people love to think that, oh, I can now do so many different things. But I, I say is uh, with social media ADHD, you can be really busy getting nothing done or <laughs> ruining so the work you've done. So busy. Do not have multiple chats open. Uh, I've done this before and something was meant for one person, or especially don't have multiple chats when something is meant that's personal and something that's meant that is professional. Mm -hmm. uh, those two don't mix. You will send something to the wrong person. Uh, that's guaranteed to happen. Uh, I mean, this comes, I mean, that's much, I remember when some people would just simply hit the, the reply button and be a reply all button and send things out to people who should have never been on the receiving end. Uh, it, they're just not paying attention there. So the key is with chats. Uh, it would be nice if you could have something that turned off when you had a second chat uh, in there. But these are the things right now you have to be mindful of. And I, and I just look at it as, where did I F up today? And put that in your journal. So then you know it's this is something you got you to gotta work on. So that's one. Don't have more than one conversation going at the same time. Uh, I will say I do have to do this sometimes for my job because I'm in a group of other YouTube managers. But then I'll have an individual chat. So at least what I'll do is I won't continue a conversation in one place. I'll wait till something else is done. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll fall back into the same, same pattern. Uh, here's another one. Email. Don't be so wordy. Uh, when you're getting so many emails, I'll say this. ADHD people are guilty of sending me essays. Uh, you know, it's like don't be – try to make – if you can, try to make one thought, one email. Uh, email I is not meant that. for conversation. Right. Uh, in fact, a lot of I am isn't meant for conversation. It's meant for okay. This is what's in my head right now, and we have an understanding here. Uh, do you really need to be concise with your emails? Um, I can have a problem sometimes because at some places where I work is it might have to be multiple threads of a conversation, and I might have to get creative and saying, okay, my latest answers are in this color, <laughs> or I'm just going to put a highlight at the top with one with one manager in social media. I said, here's the synopsis right up top. If you want more information, go down to the bottom. Uh, I I have to organize really well my email, and I use a program from InDev Software called MailTags, where I can set things by projects, by keywords, uh, so that and, and it sets tags? itself up. MailTags, yes, I I use it for Mac Mail. Uh, there are Gmail does a really good job in its own end, but since I love using my my Mac Mail, and I work in both, by the way, uh, it keeps me organized. It can even set a tickle date for me as, oh, don't forget this thing right here, or send an email out later because I don't want to send things out over the weekend and make people think I'm available 24-7, yeah. seven days a week. Um, there are others, by the way. Okay. So when we talked earlier about networking, really pay attention to how much broadcasting you're doing and how much listening you're doing. Uh, you don't have to be the center of attention all the time, and this is a problem I have. Uh, you also need to think of, you know, be responsive to what other people are saying, not just of, all right, and this is a problem I've had. Now, I want to share something I've done on that subject. It's not really listening when you're just, again, it comes across as talking about yourself. Respond to somebody else's message and content. Uh, that's what they're looking for. That's helpful participation. I agree. I have, I have a question for you. So okay. one, of the, one of the challenges that, that I have in, uh, in social media is, well, it's two things. One, it's being concise to en enough to kind of relate the idea that I'm trying to express. Because what I'll see is I'll see a post on something that I want to respond to because I think I have some value to add to it. But then I have like a thousand thoughts all at the same time about that. And then so I just end up clicking like. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, that's such like a, you know, that's the easy way out, but it's like, I can't sit there for an hour and try to craft a, a well-crafted. And I just, you know, it's like, I wish I can put a well thought out quick though response to people's, everyone's comments, but I just, my brain gets like overwhelmed by, with a hundred ideas all at the same time. So what would you suggest to, to on, on that end? 
Well, what I suggest is having your own Tumblr um, site or something where you can get the thoughts out. And then you can also connect that to your own special Facebook page if you really want to build a community around that. Because I, you see sometimes even in the ADHD Rewired community, I'll put my own ideas. And sometimes I put I'm, I'm really impressed with the crap that comes out of my brain <laughs> with thinking about something when you're not having to think about it. I think this is a gift, uh, a, a chronic gift that ADHD people like myself have. But when you have so much you want to say, and on social media, the one thing you have to be most respectful of is other people's time. Yeah. So what do you do? Give yourself an outlet. Again, we're talking about context. So what could be a good outlet? What's a very easy, fun personal blog you can do. I mean, for me, I thought of doing on Tumblr and having a site called yourdailydistraction.com because distractions are great for ADHD people when it comes to being creative, yes. but they're not so good when now you have to focus on getting something done. That again is context. You know what so, I finally did, and you, you probably, when I say this, you're going to say, yeah, I did this years ago. Um, so, you know, because I do a lot of my work is on Facebook. I have, I have the coaching group that I do. I have the um, community group that I, that I manage. Um, so, and I, so I have those things. So instead of going just into to Facebook, I actually have a folder on my uh, bookmarks so I when I click on that folder I can choose my exact place where I want to go so I go, don't get distracted by the other types of things I don't know if yeah, you do something like that imagine when uh, when there's so much <laughs> readily available to us everywhere I mean me I work in YouTube and uh, I've joked about this even when I mean I'm fortunate because I can focus on what I'm doing YouTube because it's exciting to me for people who their job isn't exciting Social media is at your fingertips. YouTube's at your fingertips. Yeah. Uh, and this is this is like crack for the ADHD <laughs> person. I mean, it is the shopping mall times a million shopping okay, malls. What is up with Vine? That is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I'm sorry. <laughs> dumbest thing I've seen. What activities aren't you? Aren't you just so much above all this, Mr. Monkey Man? No, I, I, I try. That <laughs> that's how. That's how we got to watch. What was that? A Robin uh, Williams the, the, the Super Bowl catch. That was so awesome. Uh, what What is up with that? That deals Vine and Instagram. But I mean, joking. I mean. Uh, we're joking here, but that deals with short attention span. And oh this my, is it's like, re, like this had to be created by somebody with ADHD. It's like six second videos, like six second videos. And that's more popular. I mean, when we talk about where, where is the millennials or is the younger generation going? And there's are many, many, many millennials that are, that are leaving Facebook because I consider that what their parents are doing now <laughs> and going on sites like like Vine way more often because the whole idea it goes so much in the idea of consumption now there can be there's been some very creative artists with what they've been able to do in six seconds and uh, it's it's increasing in its popularity the whole idea is you're, you're thinking to yourself one that all right if I consume from 150 different places I've accomplished something with my day that's part of the problem there but on the other end it's being mindful of oh okay I'm on Pomodoro and I got a five-minute break there's so many things I want to see, but if I can get it in six seconds, great. As opposed to, I see the, the problem with that is, oh, just one more, just one more. We think it's just six seconds, but six seconds times how many videos can add up to a half a day of distraction? It, it, this comes down to knowing yourself. Yes. It comes down to, I only have so much time and I really want to see this. How can I maximize my time? Now, you're not getting things like a backstory. You're just getting, well, I mean, this has always been the case of, hey, check out this quick thing. I mean, what was even shows like America's Funniest Home Videos back when you sent in a VHS tape? It was just a bunch of vines. <laughs> it was a bunch of check out this little thing, this little quick thing but, with I mean, Bob Saget. Those were like at least like 30 seconds, you know. Oh, it's... wow. Now we're going up to 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, okay, mister, I can pay attention for 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think that that's the key is I will watch a video. I will watch something or listen to something like your show, for example, when I can be either relaxed in the moment or I can be like I was outside this morning and shoveling. So it gave me something to do. In a sense, it's like an e-cigarette when I don't smoke, by the way. But it, sometimes we just need something to do so it can take our mind off of the boring stuff we have to do. Uh, that's where these things come in handy. But what we don't have is conversations about how we might be rewiring our brains, which brings us to the subject of, of virtual ADD. Uh, you you want to get into that a little bit? Sure. Um, yeah. So the, this idea of where all the, the digital distractions and um, the idea of, of, you know, digital media and all this kind of stuff cause ADHD that, you know, so my, my answer to that is no. G good talk, right? Good talk. All right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just amazed by that one word answer like it came from God. 
<laughs> like like it came from the voice who knows i agree i agree with you by the way um, there's a difference between exhibiting behavior and understanding on a condition and I had some fun with an article I did online on my LinkedIn profile, and I have a bunch of articles on virtual ADD on there. And uh, I was asking, you know, tongue in cheek, does social media cause ADHD? Uh, the funny thing for me was I would deal with people at workplaces who would show the behavior that was so common of me uh, because of their work environment. Sometimes it's also because it might be a mom with two young kids, not sleeping, having to multitask, forgetting stuff bringing her lunch over to her desk, thinking that will make her more productive. All it did was make you screw up more. Uh, all the things that I think are common for people, but I think as an ADHD person, you pay attention to these things more because you can relate to them before the world got to be the way it is, the hyper-connected, always-on world. Uh, and when we talk about things like neuroplasticity, when we talk about things on how people through uh, basically, you know, constant digital distractions, internet addiction, you know, compulsive behavior on social media, all these things that ADHD people can relate to before this was around. That's where I, I like using that, that term, virtual ADD, that is based on for those people who are occupied in the online slash digital ecosystem without being to, without having a healthy happy, productive life where they feel that they're in control. And I think that describes a lot of people. Right. And I think the, the, um, well, before you published your article, you, you had me look at it and I gave you some, some feedback about it. And, you know, my, my big thing is that it's just important that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, and so the things that look like, you know, ADHD doesn't mean that it is ADHD. Um, so is just digital, uh, all this digital content, does it, um, can it create these kind of things that look like it? Sure. But it does not mean that it, it is it. And I think that new, you know, you talk about how context is everything. Well, I think nuance is also part of context and that's also an extraordinarily important piece to it. So, um, yeah. So does it, does it exacerbate some of the ADHD, uh, people, people who have ADHD, does it exacerbate their symptom, their symptoms? I, I do see a lot of that. Um, uh, but does it cause it? No. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't cause it. Just like if you had, if you were removed from this, I would say an ADHD person that's untreated will still have the same behavior. Somebody who does get sleep, uh, somebody who doesn't have to do so much multitasking around the place, somebody who doesn't have to deal with all the digital distractions, will have a different outcome than someone with ADHD or untreated ADHD. And and that that is clearly the difference. Uh, I think the problem we have is while ADHD is becoming a lot more acceptable, I think it. it too often falls as an excuse for people who don't have it, who like to think that they have it, uh, who I call the maybe D's. The people who like to say, is, yeah, I got, you know, I get ADHD sometimes. You know, just yesterday I forgot where I put my car keys. Maybe D's. That's, that's good. Now, you have a thing called uh, grantasms, right? Did I, did I say that right? You said that right. Grantasms. Can, so, can I tell our audience what a, what a grantasm yeah, is? So, or, um, Grant will, will occasionally, um, sometimes they're really good. Sometimes I go swing and a miss. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's where no nuance is, is, <laughs> is left to, to figure out. I can well, even hear that swing and a miss virtually. So, you know, he'll, he'll put his own spin and create a word about a situation just like he just did regarding the, um, and I, for, and I just forgot what the word was that we, you just said. Oh, a maybe D. A maybe D. Yes, that, that would be an example of a grant, a, a grantism. Grant, now I can't even say it. Grant, take over yeah. the take over the interview. I'm going downhill. I'll, I'll from take here. over the grant has. Okay, <laughs> for, so for when you have all these, like you mentioned, Eric, I'm taking over the interview. Here. Hey, we're co-hosts. When I when I have all these ideas in my head, how you you ask, you ask me yourself, how do you channel that? Well, m what I've been working on slowly but responsibly is why not put out my own ebook on all the on all the strange s h i t uh, so you don't get that explicit rating on iTunes is coming out of my head, and I thought. Why don't I give it a name for all the things I have names for? And I call it a grantasms. And I explain when people say, what is a grantasm? First, people say, well, why don't you just call it a uh, grantisms? That's popular. I said, no, here's why I call it grantasms. It's a cross, the things that come out of my head, it's a cross between an ism and a gasm. It's an aha and an oh yeah moment. It's a hmm and a hmm. It's just basically strange stuff at strange times. It's big ideas, small wonders, and unfinished business. Great so I explanation. Thought, well, I oh, I like that. Oh, you like that? Well, that's a subtitle because I thought 
I've written some other guy's book before I knew how much work that was. And all the ideas for books that I've had, I thought, well, if I don't finish these things, why don't I just make my book about all the things I haven't finished? <laughs> and why? Can, and, you, and can that's you give us I, some of your favorites? Okay. Uh, well, one thing, I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give one that I take a little more seriously, but DQ, digital intelligence. Yes. Uh, that's a term that I like to use about how can we combine emotional intelligence with you know, the digital environment that more and more of us operate. Here's, another, here's a word that I like to use. I did this in a presentation for Chicago Mensa called GERC. Uh, there's a lot of people who like to describe themselves as geeks, nerds, and dorks, or one or the other, but don't really understand the distinctions. So for a while, I did research. Take us through that. What are, what are the distinctions? Okay. All right. Okay, uh, here's, here's the, sh the quickest way I can describe it. Um, a geek is your passion, a nerd is your expertise, and a dork is yourself. <laughs> if you could just be yourself. Uh, a gurk is somebody who identifies as a geek, nerd, and dork who is striving to be an awesome social citizen. Th there's a goal behind that. Uh, of, uh, and, and when I shared this with a group of Mensa people who, who have high IQs but lower than average social skills, sometimes really low, mm -hmm. sometimes who really fall on, on the dork end for not being mindful of context. Here, here's a good example of how I can distinguish the two. Okay. Uh, a geek is somebody who wears their Star Trek costume to a sci-fi convention. A dork is somebody who wears it to a funeral. Context, people. That is the key to be mindful of social context. When to blend in and when to stand out. I think the problem with a lot of what people want to do on social media about being discovered, be popular, be rich, whatever, is they're so busy trying to be awesome that they forget a lot of times it's about being helpful, yeah. being a good citizen, helping other people stand out, paying it forward. Those are the type of values that need to happen. Um, here's, a, here's, another, here's another thing that I might use as an as example. When I mention all the words that come in, uh, sometimes I have friends, I have gal friends that are looking for relationship advice, and so, but they're trying to come up with certain words for the relationship. Like, so I'll use, you know, he's not quite a boyfriend, but he's possibly, so I say, well, why not call him a boy find? So I do in the relationship end as well. Uh, I have all, the, all these words, like maybe somebody you don't want to say you're in love with, but uh, you, you love hanging out with them, so you call them a lovable. Uh, uh, there is, I know, here's another one. Google Hangover. I use this for us. A Google Hangout that goes on way longer than it should. <laughs> you like to talk about mind maps? I, call, I have one called a losing my mind map, you know, where you're putting way too much stuff in there. Uh, how about this? This deals with the digital stuff. Um, auto incorrect. My iPhone doesn't correct things often. It, I mean, here's an example. When I, when I was trying to type to my spouse when I was running, and I said, going out running shortly and grab dinner at 6 o'clock. Instead, it said, going out rubbing shortly. And then she responded, that's disgusting. <laughs> that's the kind of, kind of things that, that, I, that I have. But I, but I deal them with other ideas about, I mean, sometimes it's the idea of when people say they want to be perfect, I mean, your own line is perfect sucks and good enough is great. Yes. So you got to go into these ideas of things we don't really spend too much time thinking about that we probably probably should and then have conversation about because then when we're, it's teaching us to pause uh, about um, about stuff in life that we take for granted and wonder how it's how it's affecting us. Oh, here's another one. I moan. I moan is that feeling you get when you see people online waiting around for the next iPhone. Uh, the, the idea is, I mean, the, this is small, quickie stuff, but it's the kind of stuff that I want to encourage other people to have their own ideas. And if you can name it, you can master it. When you give these things names, you open up a conversation, which is my last grandtasm I'll share here, hopefully, conversation catalyst. There are jobs I could see for ADHD people where they move conversations along. Like how many people now will pay to have content out there? But it's so important to have the conversation. You could be the person who starts the conversation with a funny quip or a good insight. I can be doing a hundred different different topics and say something that might be anywhere from insightful to amusing or at least something that's a conversation starter. So I call this being a conversation catalyst. Now you can go on Fiverr to do that kind of stuff. Uh, that's where I see things for jobs for ADHD people that a social stylist could help them with. So now, now you've seen my master plan. <laughs> Master plan, people. You know, Grant, I was thinking, though, so I remember I think it was on this past uh, uh, Friday, uh, so last week, 
when there was a, I posted a thread about the video that I saw for the the, uh, the new Apple iWatch that I was just kind of drooling over, and um, then you you posted something about who wants to buy your uh, your um, 5S, because I, I think there's someone posted a thread about how you need the six, whatever, and you know, talking about emotional intelligence, you you had a comment that I just thought was kind of harsh, so I tried to soften the conversation up, and I think you're, I mean, you you were quoting uh, what's his name. Uh, a Charlton Heston in yes. the NRA reference yes, you said, you my know, cold dead hands. Yeah. Some, someone said, you know, can I get it for free? And you're like, you know, not my cold dead hands. And so I made a comment about, you know, you don't need to be so violent or, so, you know, something like that, just to, to soften up the conversation. And, and then what happened? We both started shouting each other. And I went, shut up. And then you went, you shut up. You went, shut up. And then it was. And I clearly won that conversation. No, so then I had that moment of like, oh, here's here's a great idea. So, oh, because no, you're because you're you asked the question, you're like, well, how are you going to use the phone with your cold dead hair or something? I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, well, I'm I'm sure I could look that up, but let, let's see if I recall correctly. So the guy was saying, "Hey, I'll take it from you for free." And my nature, my social style, is being sarcastic, which doesn't always transfer. A lot of times, it doesn't transfer. I online. would agree with that, Grant. From some of my interactions with you, I would agree that sometimes it does Very not much transfer. So. <laughs> I'm probably not going to change as much uh, in certain <laughs> groups like the ADHD <laughs> community. I'm an acquired taste, but uh, I would I would rather piss some people off than be forgettable. Uh, but that's but that is the risk you're always going to do, and sometimes uh, in in this case, as as the moderator of the group, you turn it into something humorous because he may not have understood that I was being sarcastic there, uh, and and said, "Okay, here's a feature on there for, um, uh, um, yeah, what if you could select in your iPhone cold dead hands?" And you created that on there uh, to say, "See, just well, all you got to do is make the, is select this feature in the settings under cold dead hands." So, so now I made you can some give screenshots, the and then I added the overlay and the accessibility. So where you know. If there was a, you know, a, a, oh, I think I made a comment about make a, a donation to the Association of Cold Dead Hands. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, the Association of Cold Dead Hands. So, you know, some people who are very, uh, you know, just for uh, analytical mind was saying, what a waste of time. This, but I say this is the kind of stuff where great ideas happen that gives you ideas for apps, fun stuff. And you just have to allow yourself to throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. And that that was to me very humorous, but that you would also take the time to do. The thing is, I'm, I used to be a professional graphic designer, so I love doing things in Photoshop, as you've seen, mm -hmm. and, and plastering something, because it, it works so much better when you can do something visually. Uh, that, that shares, that allows so much more of a conversation to happen than text alone does. So that's also one of the tips I give people is, can you find something online? Can you curate it whether, if you're not doing it yourself, whether it's an image uh, or a video? And that gives a little better context. So what you did is you created an image that gave some con context. So in this case was humor. Because I was With being information, though, because I was showing people where the accessibility features were on the iPhone. And I used the app Sketch to draw arrows to the, the point where you'd want to select. And then I just added the, the text um, for the, under the, the accessibility features for assistive touch, cold at hands. I call that misinformation. <laughs> Let, let's not go into your private world right now. <laughs> so, well, and okay. So, you know, it's one of those moments where it's like, the, I refer to it as the moment of brilliance. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just going to say I was proud of that for myself because I just thought that was clever and I came up with it quickly and I, and I executed it quickly from the you idea did. to you the, did. to the taking the screenshots to annotating it with sketch, I think it was four minutes. And, and I think that's the key is um, for you and I, I do stuff really quickly, and that's a great way to make an impact, but um, I think it's a challenge when you love what you're doing so much and when it starts consuming a lot of your time, and then you get yourself distracted. So I think it's nice when you put yourself on it. I think you have to put yourself on a timer, and this is your Facebook allowance uh, or it's your social media allowance. You figure that out. I mean, I use Freedom. There's also Rescue Time. Mm -hmm. You figure out what actually works for you in getting the job done. Uh, but what I like to do is, okay, what's in my head? And then I might do a quick search on Google because I have a search marketing background. I know where to look and find something. And I mean, even all the articles I've done on LinkedIn, I'll take something and curate it and then put my own artwork in there, design a little bit, and I know how to make it stand out for what people are going to see in their mobile devices. I understand the dimensions really well. So it's it, a good part of this is understand your audience, understand what make them laugh, 
Uh, understand if you're trying to make a, a certain point that might require, you know, um, appreciating and, and connecting with a different emotion in mind. Uh, I'll, I'll share this. You made me think of one other thing from this conversation, a disexual, a person that has a, a preference, a sexual preference for the digital advice over other people sometimes. I see, also see developing feelings of emotional attachment. Uh, there's a Dilbert cartoon on it called I Fall in Love with My I Here, Here's I'm reading to you right now. I fall in love with my iPhone. Dilbert is on a on a couch with a psychiatrist. He go, Dilbert goes, I fall in love with my iPhone phone. It entertains me. It knows where I am. It responds to my touch. It never judges me. Woman goes, so it's like a woman to you. And then Dilbert goes, way better. Hey, are you even listening? Disexual people. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget to tip your waiters. <laughs> so much. here's what we're going to do. Um, we are going to do a quick version of, you guessed it, the random question around. This is the part of the show that has nothing to do with ADHD, which then paradoxically has everything to do with ADHD. And it is no coincidence that we are starting this part of the show 15 minutes past the point of the show that we should have already ended. So are you ready? <laughs> How appropriate. I'm so glad you brought that sax player back and I was wondering what he looked like. <laughs> <laughs> that Better get that thing checked. I had no idea. Oh, gotcha. I I was I didn't catch on that for a moment, and uh, just remember that you you're referring to the overlay that will be added later. Hey, Eric. Sometimes you should listen to your own show. You know, you're right. Yeah. You know, I uh, probably in uh, the last ten episodes there was one or two where I didn't even listen to it before it went out, um, but. So I will get you distracted if I start talking about. You are so stop so talking. Other. Just stop talking, Grant. I'm a bad influence. <laughs> bad influence. All right, get your damn questions already. I want to be creative here. All right. <laughs> the uh, the standard first question in the in this round is, tell me about an invention that you would like to create or a an improvement upon a current invention. All right. I would like to improve on the Google Translator, where it doesn't just allow you to speak to anybody else in any language, but that you can understand nuance and they can also get you better as well. So it'd be the emotional intelligence humidifier. That's awesome. And theoretically, that's possible. Okay, well then I guess I'm not that creative. I'm just a copycat. Well, because if you think about, because um, I, I do a lot of work with, with individuals on the autism spectrum and looking at how we can identify uh, through pitch and where the, the voice goes up and down, how, um, you know, how our emotions are expressed, because more, more of what we communicate has to do with the tone and the delivery versus the words. Um, and there are recognizable patterns to those things. So um, that's, that's a cool idea, Grant. Well, I, I'd, like, I'd like to see that happen where if the tech understands us artificial intelligence that can also get us and i think that's the key with anything is can it get us just like if it's not just other people but machines uh, that's where i'd like to see things go but a part of that is a willingness to open up uh, so it's got to go both ways because sometimes when people talk about these things they want to get everything out from the other person but they're a private person they don't want to share it can only work as well as much as you're willing to share so that's how i envision it being a rewarding system i like it i like it Okay, so as I'm randomly thinking up of the next question on the spot, the, the next product launch that is going to be featuring the emotional intelligence virtual machine is coming soon. And Grant, you are the creator of this machine. What is the first, um, the, the first version of this computer going to be called? Give it a name. The first version, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> the first version, uh, you just assume it's a computer. For all I know, it could be something you put on your tongue <laughs> and then swallow. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll call it, uh, <laughs> I will call it Eric's crazy, crazy, crazy idea that makes me a billion dollars dot com. Um, that's already taken. Try again. Okay, I'm taking your own stuff. All right, <laughs> I'll I'll just call it. Uh, <laughs> if I if I'm remembering my own invention right here, I'm I will call it Super Socialize Me 3000. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> and I was curious, was cause that was that was a different tone of laughter that I've heard you do. So I was wondering, was that your filtering laughter? Like, were you filtering out all the things that you wanted to say but weren't, or? Uh... <laughs> no, I just didn't have an. I just didn't have a good thought in my head. Sometimes, you know, I. Sometimes I really want to think about what is what is a worthy answer uh, of a question that I would be remembered by at least for the next 10 seconds. <laughs> and your 10 seconds is up and everyone already forgot. Uh, <laughs> like so much of social media today, so don't worry about it unless, unless somebody has it in for you. All right, <laughs> then, what? Then, then it's timely. That's timeless. <laughs> what are you going to do? So you get a, a, a uh, an all access exclusive pass to the uh, the board of directors meeting at Facebook, and they want to know what do you suggest uh, to improve the social part of Facebook. All right, if I was speaking there, and hey, you know, Mark Zuckerberg happens to stop in, and goes, hey, Grant, what's shaking, baby? And I say, I'm glad you're here because you know. Eric made this meeting happen. It's um, it's so good. All of you can be in the same place at once with all your deals. I would say, guys, this like button, let us choose what kind of button we want. Uh, I don't want to be saying I like so something when I want to show empathy for somebody who's mentioning because their kid is in the burn unit. I don't want to be putting like by that. That's not that appropriate. Give us more control over what we want to say quickly. Uh, and then um, there will be a little better context and we'll have better conversations or also make it so that uh, you will give us a timer. Let us help ourselves with managing our Facebook time. They're not going to do that, <laughs> but maybe if you're willing to pay for something like that, uh, that's the problem with a lot of platforms is they don't, it's cheaper for them to have the advertisers do it than to invest in a system that gives you more control. Uh, that's the reality of the digital ecosystem here. People say they want more control. What they really want is free. But if it was up to me, I'd say switch that like button and, uh, and make it something that we can have more options with what we're trying to communicate. I like it. Now, but uh, I said, don't say it's a like button. Eric. Unfortunately, you like I'm glad you picked up on that. Uh, unfortunately, Mark Zuckerberg did not take your your advice or ideas. He did show you the door, though. So you are determined, though, to change the the social stratosphere of of digital online content. So you create the next big social platform, bigger than Facebook, bigger than Google plus or minus, um, whatever that thing is. What is it called? And what does it do that's different? I will call it the social emotifier. This is something that it is how you choose to have it on your body. You can wear it. You can swallow it. <laughs> you can make it as a gel. There, it, it can come in any form. You could have it at breakfast like your morning shake. <laughs> but however you choose to have it, it will now ha read like a time, like basically certain levels of this is what my energy level is. This is the mood that I'm in that you have to program beforehand so that you can say, well, when I'm feeling like this, I feel happy. Now I'm angry. Okay, I better program into this. This is how I feel angry. And it goes across. It can also be something you can have online if you want to share with others that you can go on a computer if you want, but that you do that is a natural extension of what you do. Uh, it does not have to be something, anything other than suits your purposes uh, meaning that sometimes people don't want to share all this stuff sometimes people just want to be better people and not have to be distracted by the idea of i have to share it to think that my life has meaning uh some people are private people but i make it based on the social emotifier people who want to feel more connected to other people because by being more connected thinking that I myself become a better person. And by being a better person, I can be better to the people I love. I can be better to, to, my, uh, to myself. I can help reach my goals. And this is about understanding your body and understanding your connection. And when you can see these as numbers and what can you mean when be in the form of a game you play with yourself because we need to do things that are fun, the social emotifier is a part of you. This is what I call being digitally human, being digitally humane. It's, it's not about the virtual world and the organic world. It's all needs to be real for you to really be a good social citizen today. So Grant, I want to thank you for coming on ADHD Rewired. And if people want to reach out to you from 
the virtual space to the real you and make that connection, what would be the best place uh, people can, can find you and your stuff? Okay, find my stuff. Well, I am on um, Twitter and YouTube and Facebook under my name, Grant Crowell, G-R-A-N-T-C-R-O-W-E-L-L, as well as LinkedIn. Uh, I'm very proud because I, I did a search and there were seven other Grant Crowells <laughs> online. And I thought there can be only one. Now, well, I that is the place you will find me. You can also go to just grantcroll.com. Um, I am actually building out my portfolio site, but that's a nice hub where you can have a good gist. And uh, I also, for fun, for, for a hobby, I do a podcast show, which is just on SoundCloud right now, but it's called Super Socialize Me. And that's based on interviews I get to have, some that are ADHD related, some that are just around... Uh, soft skills for a hard digital world. Uh, that is the thing I have the most fun doing. And I think if you want to get to know a little bit more of me, Grant Kroll, check out those podcasts. Um, it's, it's, what, it's the one thing that I, I would look forward to waking up out of bed in the morning and that I would do without there being a paycheck involved. Very, very cool. So check out grantcrowell.com. Check out his podcast on SoundCloud, and all of the links to all of these uh, these resources will be available on the show notes um, at my website. Um, and just I've gotten some feedback recently that people are really um, accessing those show notes that are created by uh, my man Richard, who creates all of these show notes, so I don't have to do it. And it is uh, that is a money well spent. So Grant. Thank you so much for being a guest, and uh, we will see you in the ADHD Rewired community. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. It has been a virtual and an organic pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure is mine. Take care. Well, ADHD Rewired super fan. Yeah, that's what I called you. You know why? Because you are still listening to the very end. And what I want to know is, have you left a review on iTunes or Stitcher? No matter where you listen, leaving those reviews on iTunes and Stitcher or follow me on SoundCloud, those comments, those reviews, they help other people find this podcast. And if this podcast has been helpful for you, do me a favor. Help other people find this podcast by going onto iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. It is extraordinarily helpful. And thank you. Do you have a great tip strategy, app, or just a funny story that you want to share with the rest of the ADHD rewired community, go to erictibbers.com slash podcast and click on the yellow record a message button. That's going to take you to the speak pipe page where you can really easily record a message right from your computer. There's also mobile apps that make it really easy to do. That's also speakpipe.com slash ADHD rewired. Those links will be in the show notes in your podcast app or at erictavers.com slash fifth. Check us out on Facebook. We have both a Facebook page and the growing and very active community group. Don't forget, once you submit your request, you will need to hear from me. If I have no way to contact you because your settings are set up in a way that makes it impossible for me to contact you. There's nothing I can do about it. And right now there's like 80 people who are in that category. And I don't know what to tell you. Uh, reach out to me, send me a friend request. Let me know that you're trying to get into the Facebook community group because I'd love to have you. You can also find me, I'm on Twitter at Eric Tivers and maybe I should start doing this kind of rewired hashtag thing. I think I'm sort of figuring out Twitter and uh, I just downloaded Instagram. I really don't know what I'm doing on there yet. Um, but that's that's really all for me. I am um, I'm getting back in my workout routine, which is awesome. I'm um, getting back into my sleep routine, not all the way back there yet, but getting back there and my productivity is um, I keep taking kind of two steps forward, one step back, but today has been a really good day. And that's the direction I hope that I continue to go in. And that's the direction that you can continue to do and grow in. So what is the one thing that you can do today, right now, that can make a small difference in improving your life, maximizing your productivity, because it's often a lot of little things that make a big difference. Thank you so much for listening. Share the love. Tell somebody else about this podcast. And thanks again. 
I'll see you next time.